Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Richardson, and today I am putting the AP in Happy, where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. This podcast will give a voice to accounts payable team members by talking about the growing reality of cyber attacks in their world and which vendor setup and vendor management techniques they can apply to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by the Authentication, Validation, and Management Toolkit for those AP vendor maintenance teams that still have a mostly manual process and need fraud prevention at each critical step of the vendor maintenance process. Go to DebraRRichardson.com to see the authentication techniques, internal controls, best practices, and what template forms, vendor communications, and desktop procedures are included. Stay tuned. It's common practice for accounts payable vendor maintenance to call the vendor when there is a change requested to the vendor's bank account. And as you know, there is no shortage of fraud being reported for AP teams not to know that additional validation protects companies from making fraudulent payments. The question is, are AP teams driving up volume of required vendor confirmations by not adding additional authentication processes because they know the vendor is going to be called anyway? Welcome to episode 34, Vendor Banking Update, Why Calling the Vendor is Not Enough for Fraud Prevention. So you may be wondering, why did I dedicate a blog post and a podcast to talking about um, calling vendors and confirming banking change updates? And that's a good thing, right? And it absolutely is. It absolutely needs to be done. But the problem that I want to address is relying on that confirmation of banking details with the vendor at the expense of not only your staff having to take more time out to do those confirmations. And that does take time because they have to go in and they have to find the vendor's information because of course you're not going to confirm with the email um, requests that came in. Um, So it takes time to go in, look that vendor up, get that information. And some accounts payable to Teams out there will go as far as getting an actual invoice that's been paid and in some cases months old and they will get uh, information from that invoice and use that to confirm. So that takes time. Not to mention those vendors that don't answer the phone. So now you've got to log and you've got to keep track um, because you know you still have to confirm with the vendor and that may take back and forth, back and forth calls with the vendor to even connect to confirm. And that does come at a cost for your not only your team, but also the supplier that is getting these calls and then have to confirm that that is not a request that they submitted. And so now they know that you've processed a fraudulent request. And yes, they are happy that you called and it didn't get um, all the way through to send a fraudster their payment. But are there processes that could have been put in place to disqualify requests earlier so that you didn't have to contact the vendor? You could disqualify that request prior to having to involve the vendor. So let's take a look at the typical process when AP receives a request to update a vendor's banking. So the first thing is they will receive the request to update the banking details. 
And this can be an email or a phone call, and they may be looking for a form or the instructions of how to update their banking. So you receive the request to update the banking details, and then the branded ACH form, hopefully um, you have one of those, along with instructions on how to submit. So the next step is that branded ACH form is completed and received back and at that point, the vendor is searched for in the accounting system. And then once the vendor is found, you review the vendor record to verify that this truly is a change of banking. So you take a look at their current banking and make sure that what they want to change is actually a different uh, set of uh, banking details. And on that note, um, you know, you'd be surprised and I'm sure you guys aren't, but maybe others that are looking in AP would be surprised as to how many requests we get in to change banking um, and it's the exact same banking that we already have on file. Just saying. So anyway, you get that in and you verify that it truly is a change of banking and then you want to take that a bit further now and you want to verify that the routing number is correct. Um, anything that could stop it from being processed once it's confirmed because as again, we out here that's been out in the trenches, we know that we don't want to go back to the vendor, have them confirm it, only to have to come back to them again when we figure out the routing number is incorrect. You know, the vendors hate that. You know, they want us to identify all issues before we communicate back to them. So, you know, everybody learns that the hard way. But in, in any event, you verify the information that's on the form and then you confirm with the vendor that the banking change is valid and you do that using a phone number, email address, or remit um, address that is already on the vendor record. So you have those seven steps. And what I am suggesting is that you look at those processes and you add authentication to several of those steps to disqualify as many requests as you can before you get to the step where you confirm with the vendor. So let's take a look at what that would look like. Okay, so the first step was to receive the request to update the banking details. Now, here is an opportunity to authenticate the requester. Now, whether they are calling on the phone or sending an email, you can ask two or three identifying questions from different areas to authenticate that uh, requester before providing instructions or your branded ACH form. So for example, you can ask that they provide you with the last four digits of the tax ID and that's from the vendor record. You can ask that they provide you the last payment date and that would be from their AR department. And you can ask for the last invoice amount and that would be from the invoice. Only if they answer the questions correctly should a banking form be sent to the email address on file. Again, not a reply to the request. So you received the request to update the banking details. You authenticated the requester and you sent the branded ACH form along with the instructions to update the banking details. Now, the next step is you receive the completed branded HCH form back. So here is another place that you can add authentication. This is where you authenticate the banking form because you can require authentication criteria on that form as well. It can be the old banking, they should have it. And if they don't have it, that means you're really not dealing with the correct person at the company. And you guys are familiar with our retention schedules. Banking information has to be kept seven to 10 years. So if they come back and say they don't have it and that's one of your requirements, then you push back, find someone else at the company that can provide it for you because they should have it. 
so you can ask for the old banking or you can ask for their last three deposit dates and amounts. Find some type of criteria that can authenticate that makes sense in your business. Um, you can also require that the tax ID be on the banking form. So the more information that the vendor should have that would be harder for a fraudster to get is uh, a good idea to include that on the banking form. And keep in mind, too, that if you have been just giving out the banking form without authenticating the requester first, you may be just getting in these random completed banking forms. So you still have to authenticate the banking form because that first authentication for the requester may not have been done. And on that note, um, it's also a good idea to update that branded ACH form um, every year or every two years so that you know if you receive or your team receives in an older version of the form, it could be an indication of fraud. So you've gotten in that uh, banking form, you've authenticated it. Now you're going to search for the vendor in the accounting system or the ERP. You're going to review the vendor record to verify that this is indeed a change of banking. And then the next step is you're going to verify that the routing number is correct. And this is another place where authentication can be added. You can authenticate the banking details. And what I mean by that is you can validate bank account ownership. And that is the vendor name or the bank account holder name and the bank account number. You can verify that, that, that it matches. Now, this is a paid service and you can look at early warning. And I know I've talked about them before in uh, blogs and podcasts, but you can look at Early Warning or one of their uh, resellers. And I've also talked about in the past GIAC uh, systems, but they have other resellers as well. And the difference is, is you have to um, bank with one of the banks that uh, participate or own the Early Warning system. And if you don't, then you go to GIAC systems. But anyway, I will go ahead and put a link to both of those in the show notes if you'd like to explore options for your company. So before we go to the last step of confirming with the vendor, let's review the three processes or the three places where we can add authentication in to disqualify those fraudulent requests. So the first one was to authenticate the requester by asking identifying questions. Now, if the fraudster cannot answer those questions, then they don't make it to the next step when you send them the branded ACH form and instructions. Now, how many fraudulent requests can you disqualify from the start and not even send a branded banking ACH form by asking these questions? The second place to add in authentication was on the banking form. So let's say you just received a banking or branded ACH form out of the blue. You're going to authenticate that banking form because you've included some information that only the vendor should know. Now, how many fraudulent requests do you think you can disqualify because they don't know the authentication criteria to complete the form? Now, the third one was at the point where you are verifying the routing number and the authentication is to validate bank account ownership, which means verify that the bank account holder name, the vendor name and the bank account number match. Now, how many fraudulent requests do you think you can eliminate or disqualify with this process? So by the time you get to the last step where you confirm with the vendor, you have disqualified fraudulent request. Now, definitely less fraudulent requests will make it to the confirm step. And this lets your vendors know that you have processes in place to keep their payments safe and that they will only expect a call if they submit a request to change their banking. Does your department have any tips to keep our vendor payments safe? I would love to hear about it. Email me at Deborah 
at DebraRRichardson.com or place a comment on the platform that you choose to listen. And if you're looking to add fraud prevention that includes authentication to your manual vendor setup and maintenance process, get the toolkit that I mentioned before. I will have a link in the show notes. So thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed the 34th episode of putting the AP in happy podcast where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Don't forget to check the show notes for the links mentioned in the podcast. And if you're a longtime listener, how about sharing it with teammates or someone else in accounts payable that you know that would enjoy listening to someone that truly enjoys AP. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and writing a review of my podcast on the platform that you use to listen. Stay happy. Stay happy.